Hello, and welcome to Chillers and Thrillers, the paranormal podcast where I read true stories of people's encounters with the strange and unexplained. No comedy, gore, or skepticism, only 100% true spooky tales. In this episode, we'll be taking a trip down to the UK and Ireland to hear true stories of people's encounters with the supernatural. England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and Ireland have a very long history made up of bloody battles, diseases, wars, and hardships that have influenced the landscape and culture. So it's not surprising to hear that they have some of the most haunted locations in the world. Scotland, Ireland, and Northern Ireland in particular have a very strong belief and superstition around the Fae. Many scholars' opinions differ in the field of fairies and folklore throughout the British Isles, but one thing that has been agreed upon is the theory that stories from fairy tales are relics of ancient mythologies. But this is not the Tinkerbells of Disney. The Fae can veer from mischievous to malevolent if disrespected. In the Victorian era, the spiritualism craze swept the UK, even making its way into the monarchy, with Queen Victoria and her husband Albert hosting regular seances in Windsor Castle. The belief in spiritualism and paranormal continues today, with one in five adults in the UK believing in ghosts and spirits. I also want to preemptively apologize if I mispronounce any locations or places. This is not done out of disrespect or lack of trying, but trust me, you do not want to hear my Scottish, English, Irish, or Welsh accent. And if you're looking for more stories about hauntings from the UK, I recently came across and binged episodes of the podcast, Ghost Haunted with Molly. In this podcast, your host Molly explores haunted tales from different counties and countries in the UK. I've included the link for her podcast in the show notes. Now, turn down the lights, get comfortable, and let's get started. The Farm Submitted by user Els Belaz. In my early 20s, I worked on a farm for two years in rural England. I was straight out of university and keen for a roof over my head and a purpose in life. I was treated like family and did all the normal chores. I cared for the horses mostly, as they were my main focus of interest. But I got to know the dairyman, we'll call him Mike, and I soon had responsibility for the whole dairy goat herd. Within a few weeks, I was inducted into how to use the electronic milking machine and what to look out for. As well as showing me the ropes and helping me to get to know the girls, goats are sweet darling creatures, he told me some more about the history of the site. The owners had taken over the site in 2000 from another family member who had done nothing with it. He was a little odd and few oddities were found around the place. For example, he buried a Land Rover rather than sending it away for scrap, and they found the fully preserved complete skeleton of a large dog in a shed, completely encased by thorns. They always wondered if he left the animal there. The owners had leveled everything that was there and built two huge barns, all the animal housing, the milking parlor, and the dairy as well as their own house and the stockman's cottage. It was amazing. They had built it all themselves with their own hands. Construction was long, and during the process, something happened that stayed with them and stayed on the land. Mike told me the story of the building in the dairy and milking parlor. When building, foundations are key, especially on land near the sea with a high percentage of sand and clay in the soil, which can cause flooding. The foundations were dug deep and filled with what we call hard core. Hardcore is stone, rock, and brick, pieces of old demolished buildings or pieces of mountains. When some was ordered, one of the owners, who we'll call Steve, had some problems. After two days of waiting and it arriving, he called and was promised some from London from a place they were demolishing. Sure enough, it arrived and building began. Steve and his dog, a faithful black lab, would sit together building and sorting, using the JCB digger when necessary. During the digging and sifting of the hard core, things were found. Whatever building this was from was old, very old, pre-Victorian old. Huge pieces of window frames that looked like they had come from a Gothic church. 
pieces of what might have been a statue. Then they found the bones. Steve had no idea where they had come from, but with the dog with him, he assumed they had come from the ground and that the dog had found them. They were long and burned at one end. Steve sat them in the kitchen as something interesting to show his wife, who we'll call Elizabeth. The bones stayed in the kitchen for some time, and Elizabeth's father, who at the time was a lecturer at Cambridge University, came by. He was a man of science, but also a lay preacher. He was also rational. When he saw the bones, he asked Steve where they were from. Steve told him that he thought they were likely sheep bones or similar, and they had been found lying around. Elizabeth's father's face was white. Steve, that's a human femur. Steve stayed calm. Sure, Elizabeth's uncle was odd, but he wasn't a killer. If they hadn't come from the soil, there was only one place it would have come from. He made a call to the company that had supplied the hardcore. Keeping calm, he told them he had found some interesting artifacts and asked where his had come from, for curiosity's sake. As the company had demolished the place themselves, they were able to say, You must mean the crematorium. Yes, we've had a few calls about pieces people have found. The farm is a quiet place, and while there is a main road not far away, the most prominent sound is the various animals and wildlife, the birds and at-night owls. It's not what you'd call a creepy place, but the bones hadn't been in the kitchen long before small things started to happen. Stuff would move, the usual thing you'd put down to the absent-mindedness. The movement detector light in the hall would come on for no reason. Once it was known what they were and where they had come from, it was clear that the bones should go with other pieces from the crematorium, and within days it was buried under the parlor with dignity. Elizabeth's father did a service. It wasn't long before things started missing in the parlor. It would seem to have been moved. When feeding goat kids, bottles would go missing after washing and reappear in strange places. But it is nothing compared to the gentleman. Steve said he appeared first in the winter after construction, when the room is coldest. With no heating and no insulation, it easily drops well below freezing. The gentleman would stand and watch, just in the field of vision. Always the same spot in the corner of the parlor. Silent, respectful, about six foot two, including the top hat. A complete human shadow. Only shadows aren't solid. That's not Mike's description, nor is it Steve's. It's mine. He has been seen by all of us. The gentleman wasn't alone, though. In fact, by our reckoning, there are three. The gentleman, the boy, who I nicknamed Billy, and the trickster. Billy was very different. He would commonly be mistaken for Elizabeth and Steve's own son, who at this point was an only child, age three. I have seen balls come bouncing from nowhere and the goat kid bottles snatched from people's hands. But I have seen Steve and Elizabeth's son in fits of giggles laughing at a some unseen joke. It certainly wasn't sinister. Like the gentleman, Billy was quiet enough and caused little trouble, but you knew when he was there. It was the trickster who unnerved me, and he was rarely seen, but you knew when you did. He was about five foot nine, had short hair, and was scruffier than the gentleman. He was also less respectful. Steve, Elizabeth, Mike, and I would talk about the visitors in the dairy like they were part of the routine but none of them had the experience I did on Valentine's Day, 2009. When there was activity, Steve would see it in the morning milking and I would see it at evening milking. At dinner, we would swap stories and always find similarities, but not this time. It was dark when I set up the parlor at 5 p.m. and began milking. The only light from the side of the farm is from the dairy, the parlor, and the barn. Otherwise, it is pitch black. The machine is loud, and as usual, I had headphones in. The goats are brought into the parlor and loaded into the gates, ready for milking. Within minutes, I knew he was there. I pulled out the headphones. He was standing just on the edge of my peripheral vision, 
and kept moving slowly towards me. I knew it was the trickster. I turned around, and as I did, I saw the shadow move away. I turned back to Milking, and I could feel him creeping back. I shouted, I can see you, and he darted away. This happened a number of times. Having made it clear I wanted to be left alone, I kept working, trying to finish as quickly as possible so the goats didn't get cold standing around. That's when I heard the crash come from the barn. The gate behind the parlor had been pushed over, and I saw a small, black figure scurrying away. Livid that the dog had got into the feed store, I screamed her name, and she came padding along behind me from the dairy, where she had been sitting, waiting to be given some milk. The trickster wasn't leaving me alone, and I told him again, For goodness sake, stop this and leave me alone! At the end of the milking, I filled the sinks with water to wash down, adding chemicals and checking the milk tank. As I did, he returned. I had had enough. I was exhausted. I was cold. I wanted to finish milking and spend the night with my beloved who would be picking me up in a few hours. It was cold and it was dark and he wasn't leaving me alone and kept getting in my space. In a fit of pure annoyance, I shouted the most hurtful thing I could think of, especially to a ghost. I'm sick and tired of this. Go away and get a life. The reaction was immediate. I had never seen them moving things until then, and to be honest, I wasn't certain they could. I saw the shadow running at the door, out of the parlor, and into the dairy room. The door flew open. I ran inside following it, and I saw the shadow run to the sinks, turning both off, sliding the sliding door open, and slamming the door shut behind him. And then he was gone. I just stood there in silence, staring at the door. As with many encounters with the visitors, I could never be sure that it was real. Was it a shared delusion? The water in the sink was still, taps firmly off. I had seen the door shake as he slammed it, felt it vibrate from the force of the slam. In the silence, Steve walked in from the other end of the dairy. He was here, I said, and he wouldn't leave me alone. I know, Steve said, he was around all morning. The visitors are now gone. We no longer see them in the dead of winter. While in some ways I miss them, I do think that me telling them to go away was for the best. I don't know what they were, but a mystic came around the farm a few months earlier. As she left, she looked up at the goat barn and said to Steve, There are three of them, aren't there? A man and two very naughty boys. But they mean you no harm. I moved off the land a year later, but still visit the farm in Farmset. Since the Valentine's Day happening, things have quieted down, but they haven't stopped completely. I've had my name whispered in my ear, twice, six months apart, in the kitchen, in the same spot the bones used to be. Someone knows I still visit and wants me to know that he's still there. Loftus Hall, submitted by user Tiffany A. King. I live in County Wexford, Ireland, near Loftus Hall, once built as the most haunted house in Ireland, which is saying something. It's been sold and been renovated as a golf resort now. For years, it was a tourist attraction with let us scare you actors during tours. Most of that was BS. But if you Google Loftus Hall photos, you will see one snapped by a tourist that could be faces looking out of the window. My son and his partner do equestrian shows and were hired the Halloween before lockdown to do some shows at Loftus Hall. It involved riding outside carrying torches on horseback, supposed to be the headless Irish horseman, the Dullahan, and in another part, the devil to take you to hell. In one bit of the tour, my son would ride one of the horses into a room. The last show ended after midnight, so it was about 1 p.m. when it was time to load the horses to leave. But the truck wouldn't start. The battery was dead. So my son goes in to ask for a jump. The owner's wife says something like, Not again. Okay, take this and go out and try. And she hands him a crucifix. My son thinks it's a joke and says, Wait, you really mean it? 
the woman tells him to just do it. So he goes, and with the crucifix beside him, this time, the truck starts. Then his partner, who spent a lot of time waiting outside with the horses, told him how her night had been gone. How her night had gone. The horses kept watching things moving in what had been the family graveyard. Ears pricked, curious, occasionally wickering, or sometimes completely eye-rolling frightened. During the act, they would move as if avoiding something she couldn't see. These were brave horses, Mustangs, so very well trained. They jumped through fire and carried riders with burning torches. My son's partner is completely insensitive to anything psychic, but the horses convinced her. There was something awake and restless in and around the house that night. The Townhouse, submitted by user Hi Hi Hi. After college, I lived with my boyfriend in his family's townhouse in one of the oldest parts of London. They had told me lots of stories about the ghost, which I found entertaining and ridiculous in equal parts. Nothing could have prepared me for living there. The house is large and our bedroom was in the attic. I had my first experience the first night that I spent there. About 30 seconds after my boyfriend left the room to go downstairs, the door started opening and closing, first slowly, then fast. Then the window started doing the same thing. A minute later, the computer screen started turning on and off. All these things were happening simultaneously as I sat on the bed, paralyzed by fear. Everything stopped and returned to silence the moment I heard my boyfriend coming back up the stairs. The next morning, I woke up early and sat at the computer desk as my boyfriend slept. Everything was normal until a book went flying past me, about an inch from my nose, flying from one end of the room to another. This was the moment I officially ran out of logical explanations and all my core beliefs about life and death, well, died. I lived there for two years and had paranormal experiences every single day. There was the usual, doors and windows opening and closing, things falling off shelves and walls, and objects mysteriously moving around. I would also often hear footsteps coming from different floors, and occasionally a muffled whisper in my ear. The cleaning lady was always spooked by the footprints that would appear just moments after vacuuming the carpet. The TV practically never worked, even though it was all state-of-the-art equipment and engineers couldn't find a problem. I once spent a week alone in the house and locked the bedroom door every night for extra safety. Every morning that week, I woke up to an unlocked door, and bizarrely, the toilet seat was always up. Every night, I would hear the soft sounds of shuffling. Imagine the faint scraping sound a glass makes on a table if you push it about an inch. It always sounded like someone was tiptoeing around and touching my things. The stories are endless, but you get the picture. Over time, I became more sensitive to the paranormal. I started to pick up on the slightest changes in temperature, smell, sound, and even touch. And I would often know if the ghost was coming or already in the room, moments before something more dramatic and ghostly would start happening. Then I started seeing the ghost. It was usually a shadow, often out of the corner of my eye. But there were a few occasions where I saw it in the form of a floating ball of light, brighter than a laser, that would expand, contract, and then disappear in a split second. I know that sounds crazy, and deep down I often wondered if I was losing it. But a year and a half in, we got a dog. And not only were all my suspicions confirmed about the haunting, but it became more intense. The dog clearly saw and heard all the same things as us, and more. Often, he would stare and growl at something invisible inside the room. It was fascinating to observe him and look where he was looking, except for the times when his head would slowly turn until he was looking directly at me. I once had a dream so real and vivid that I felt spooked all day. I was getting ready for work and looking for my eyeshadow palette, when suddenly a young woman with short hair ran into the bathroom holding her mouth and looking at me with a frantic look in her eyes. It looked like she was screaming, but no sound came out. 
I forgot about this dream until about a year later. My boyfriend's parents decided to renovate the house and hired a renowned feng shui master to do an assessment of the energy flow and furniture placement. After showing him around the house, he brought up the ghost and told us that he had seen her upstairs. He said she was a teenager who looked like a tomboy with her short hair. He also said she had died in a dentist chair and was unable to cross over after the traumatic death. The way he described her was eerie, just like the girl in my dream. However, we didn't really know quite what to make of it. As far as we knew, the house had always been residential. A couple years later, there was talk of selling the house, and my boyfriend's parents hired a historian to research and write a report about the history of the house, since there was practically no information available. I didn't think much of it until I casually read through it and came across a chapter about the dental practice era in the late 1800s. The Battlefield Submitted by user Sashame The creepiest thing that has ever happened to me happened in Scotland. Having Scottish ancestry and being greatly interested in Scottish history, I had a specific interest in the Jacobite uprising that was eventually crushed at Culloden. As an undergrad, I found an opportunity to study in Edinburgh, Scotland, and getting up to Culloden Battlefield was one of my top priorities. So one weekend in March, I made the trip to Inverness. I stayed in Inverness overnight on a Saturday, and my train back to Edinburgh was mid-morning Sunday. So I woke up early that Sunday morning and took the bus out to the battlefield and visitor centre. The weather was typical Scottish weather, which meant blustery and rainy. Probably very similar to the type of day the Scottish rebel army woke up to the day they were crushed. I arrived before the visitor centre opened, though the battlefield didn't require the centre to be open to walk on it. Because of the weather and the time of day, I found myself alone at the site. Only having so much time to visit, the fact that I would be walking the battlefield alone didn't really bother me. Nowadays, the battlefield is a collection of walking paths, plaques, and signs describing the battle in question, where the forces lined up, etc. A memorial with a cairn and stones, marking clan names over mass graves, sit at the center of the site. I walked out along the English lines first, as they were nearest to the visitor center. It was interesting, but I was more focused on trying to keep my umbrella from turning inside out, while also trying to keep from getting soaked from the rain so it wasn't very memorable. I made my way into the memorial area and took a few photos of the mass grave markers and whatnot, but I was pretty much ready to leave. Though I was cold, wet, and not really enjoying the experience, I had to at least walk the Jacobite lines. It was why I was here, and who knows when I would be back. I made my way through the memorial onto the backside of the battlefield, where the Scottish rebels had once lined up. As I stepped foot out of the memorial area, the hairs on the back of my neck shot up and a chill went up my spine. This was particularly memorable as I was more focused on my physical discomfort than on the idea of ghosts or anything of that nature. Rationalizing that I was being silly, I forced myself to walk on. The path led into the lines a little bit along a low stone wall then turned right parallel to how the soldiers would have lined up, eventually looping back around the English lines, which I had intended to walk. I made the right turn. That uneasy feeling wouldn't quit. But I'm fairly stubborn, and I wasn't going to let my imagination rule me. I walked, mind made up. I suddenly heard the sound of running feet on wet gravel. My mind told me it was a jogger to some relief. I was ready to see another person just to break this spooky spell. Almost on instinct, I stepped off the path and turned so the person could run on by and found myself looking at an empty path behind me. Well, this scared the heck out of me. I stepped back on the path and took a few more steps, but I was in such flight or fight mode that the spooky feeling had almost turned into terror. I finally decided to give up and turned around. I walked slash ran back along the path. And as I did, I saw out of the corner of my eye something sort of 
bluish, running parallel to me, 20 yards or so away, towards the memorial area, almost as though to cut me off. I think I actually did break into a run at this point, though the thing vanished when I turned my gaze upon it. I tore up the path and made the left turn and bolted to the memorial area. As I stepped foot back into the area where the grass was trimmed and the mass grave markers lined the path, that feeling of dread and terror vanished. I stopped, looked backwards, trying to decide whether any of that was real, but not brave enough to venture back out into the lines to see so for myself. Finally, I opted to leave. I can't really say what happened, but as I was walking out of the battlefield, I saw the visitor center attendant arrive. I asked them if anyone had ever mentioned seeing weird things out there and got quite the look. It was truly a spooky moment. The Department Store, submitted by user Breakfast Burrito. Almost a decade ago, I was working for a department store part-time while studying. This was in Wales. 90% of the staff were students also, and this one Halloween night, we were all irritated by having to work a shift when everyone else was out emptying the pubs of everything alcoholic. There were no customers in that night, so we sat on the display furniture and began to tell stories. After a few stories, we began to prod an older gentleman who worked with us, as he remained stoic and unusually grumpy during our tales, wringing his hands and looking uncomfortable. He told us we were being disrespectful and spirits were nothing to mess with. We prodded him further for why he felt this way so strongly, and eventually he gave in and said, almost exasperated, that he would tell his tale, but no one ever believed him and he was sick of telling it. Outside of Cardiff, the capital of Wales, there's a tiny cute town called Cowbridge. The houses are ancient, hundreds of years old. His wife and their toddler-aged daughter all moved into a beautiful carriage house dating back to the 1600s. All was well. The landlord had agreed to let them renovate and decorate in exchange for skipping some rent. They met the neighbors and were amused by the promises that they wouldn't stay long as no one ever stays long in that house. They began to decorate the entrance hallway and one day accidentally knocked through the wall. Realizing that behind some drywall and plasterboard, there was actually a large space, extending back a few meters in an arch, with a bench embedded into the wall. Their daughter loved it. She pulled off the plasterboard, and they allowed her to have it as a space to keep her toys in play. She spent hours in there, while they happily got on with unpacking and slowly making the house their own. Life went on. My coworker was working as a cameraman at the time, He was filming one day when his wife rang and demanded that he come straight from work to meet her at his mother's house. He obliged, hearing her panicked tone, and rushed there. When he got to his mother's house, he found an angry, upset, and confused wife and a happy daughter. Yet his daughter had a clear red hand mark on her cheek, as though slapped. Outraged and confused, he had barely asked when his wife began to fill him in about the events of the day. His wife explained that she was making lunch in the kitchen, their daughter was happily playing in her arch. She heard a loud slap and an angry screech from her daughter, who came running into the kitchen, holding her face. Mummy, mummy, she cried, looking angry. The thing in my den hit me. Thinking her daughter had perhaps been injured by one of her toys, She pried back her hand and was surprised to find a large red handshape on her daughter's cheek. What thing in your den? She asked, beginning to get a little freaked out. It looks like a spider and it wears a hood, replied her daughter. They moved out that very day with little resistance from the landlord and knowing chuckles from their neighbors. He told us later he did some research and discovered the house was once used to hide persecuted priests, and the den for his daughter was most likely a priest hidey hole built to keep the priests safe from those searching for them. Needless to say, the rest of the shift was very quiet, and he was almost triumphant in his managing to bring us all to a stunned silence with his tail. 
Harriet Place. Submitted by user Colonel Mustard's Last Stand. I should preface this by saying that I have never seen a ghost or had any weird experiences, but my mom, who is more sensitive than I am, has them constantly. She's had multiple family members appear to her after they passed. She's had ghosts appear and react to her presence simply because she entered an old house. It's just something that she's used to, and it's never been something that upsets her or that she talks about that much. So anyway, a few years ago, when I was living in the UK, my parents came to visit me during the summer. Since my dad's family is from Scotland, we decided that it would be fun to go visit and spend a week driving around the various places before ending up in Edinburgh, though none of us had been there before. We checked into our hotel, which wasn't in the fanciest part of town, but was quite near the university, which my dad had wanted to see, because his grandfather had studied at the Divinity School there. We went out for a wander and asked the man at the desk if there was somewhere nearby he recommended eating after we were done walking around. He gave us a name of a road, and off we went. On the way back, we passed a road that I thought was the one he had mentioned to us, so we turned down and started to walk. We fairly quickly realized that this wasn't the right place, because there was a tall wall to our right and some fairly nondescript buildings to our left, none of which were restaurants. Right when I was about to turn to my mom and say I thought we made a wrong turn, she suddenly gasped and grabbed on tightly to my arm. I turned to look at her, and she was as white as a sheet and swatting at something invisible in front of her face. I asked her what on earth was going on, and she said to me in a horrified voice, Oh my god, they're, they're everywhere. I can see stacks of plague victims piled on top of each other on carts, sitting next to this wall. There's some that aren't quite dead yet, and they're reaching out to me, begging me to help them. They're swarming me and grabbing me. I, as usual, felt exactly nothing. But seeing how upset she was by the whole thing, we turned around and hightailed it out of there. What I find particularly sad about the whole thing is that my mom is a nurse practitioner, and I sometimes wonder if they didn't somehow recognize that, hoping that she could help them. As if this isn't weird enough on its own, I was thinking about it a few months later and went to Google Maps in an effort to figure out where we were and see if there might have been any historical validity to her experience. As it turns out, the tall wall to our right that she had seen the bodies piled against is on Harriet Place and encloses the campus of the George Harriet School, but also Greyfriars Kirkyard, which is said to be one of the most haunted places in Scotland. If you Google it, the internet will tell you a lot about the Mackenzie poltergeist. But the thing that stopped me in my tracks is a fact that a lot of the articles about the Kirkyard just mention in passing that the graveyard is higher than the level of the ground around it because of the plague pit that exists there. The Village, submitted by user The Red m M&M. m while I was doing my degree, I had to do some field work, and this entailed spending some time in a quaint UK village for a few weeks. The locals were very welcoming, and it made a nice change from normal co coursework. However, right away, I noticed that the villagers were a bit odd about some things. For example, you had to close your curtains before dark, and preferably before dusk. It was a done thing, and if you forgot, someone would end up knocking on the door to gently remind you. I don't want to disturb you, but to, you seem to have forgotten your curtains. I would smile awkwardly and thank them for the reminder and close the curtains, because, well, what else was I going to do? Not close them? After being told otherwise? Unthinkable. And the villagers were also obsessed with escorting us, myself and the other university girl who shared my accommodations, home after dark. Even though it was just the local pub and we could see our house from there. Nope, someone always insisted on walking us all the way home. I just figured it was small village life and didn't think much of it. But one night, I came home by myself on the last bus as a, after visiting the nearest town. It was late enough that it was properly nighttime, but there was no one around to notice me and forcibly escort me to the home like usual. I got about halfway between the bus stop at home when I noticed something moving on the window ledge out of one of the houses. 
My first thought was that it must have been a large squirrel or a cat. But as I got closer, I realized it was no such thing. And this is when things get weird. The thing on the window ledge reared up and looked at me dead on. And it wasn't a cat. It was a man. But he couldn't have been much taller than my forearm, some 30 or 40 centimeters, perhaps. He had a row of nasty, sharp, even teeth. This I remember clearly. I also distinctly remember his attire, and this is why I know it wasn't an animal. It was a rough fabric like corduroy, with a row of silver buttons on the front. I wish I was kidding. Anyway, the awful thing made a sound like a low hiss, jumped down from the windowsill and dashed off into the garden. It sounds like the most BS bizarre thing ever, and half of me questions whether it was just a hallucination. I was sober if it matters and have never had any similar experiences before or after. But the other half of me knows what I saw. Shaken and panicking, I rushed the rest of the way home and threw myself inside. Later on during my stay, I did ask the other girl if she had ever seen anything strange in the village, but she hadn't. I was too shy and embarrassed to speak to any of the villagers about it. I spent the last weeks of my placement on edge, basically never ventured out after dark again. I didn't see anything else weird for the duration of my stay. Even now, a couple of decades later, I still find the whole thing shameful. It's not like seeing a ghost or lights in the sky. It was a little man, for God's sake. I know it's ridiculous, but I also know what I saw. The Theater Group, submitted by user Happy Joe. This story has multiple witnesses who have discussed the situation over and over in searching for logical explanations, but we have never found one. I founded a touring theater group in 1999, and in 2001, we were out on the road performing at English Heritage Properties, which consisted of ancient castles, stately homes, monasteries, churches, burial mounds, stone circles, and so on. I'm fortunate enough to have stayed on the sites of and performed at more than half of England's castles, and I've seen, heard, and felt some downright bloody chilling events as a result. My cast on this occasion were at a smallish castle in Ashby de la Zouche. We pulled up in the bus, had a drink, we pulled up in the bus, had a drink, surveyed our performance space, and set to work setting up. I took a few pictures of the cast in those moments, capturing the setup and the teamwork for posterity. Later, after our performance, the grounds were locked up. We were given the keys to the castle and left to set up our tents and find food and drink. Usually we would drink wine or beer, barbecue food, chat, wander around the castle in darkness, and occasionally play hide and seek. Hide and seek in castles and stately homes is hard, funny, and sometimes scary. It was midsummer, the weather was warm, and the nights were light until late. We began to play hide and seek a little before dusk. Carl was seeking, and a little while later, after a number of successful finds, he had arrived in the ruins of the church of the castle. I had seen at least one other cast member head in that direction. I was hiding to the east of the church, a ruined wall in front of me, and I was technically in what might have been a courtyard. Ruined arches ran north to south, and Andrew was hiding somewhere in there. Carl stood somewhere between Andrew and I, within the church walls, calling out in a vaguely drunker slur that he had already found Paul. He could see his white t-shirt, and he should just go back to the others and drink while he found Andrew and I. He turned towards me and spotted me quickly, so I stood up and approached the church. Carl turned back to the church, and a white figure ran from north to south. Carl, calling after him to stop, now assuming it must be Andrew. Carl was insistent. I saw you, he shouted as the figure vanished. I watched, still some distance away, the length of the midsection of the church plus half the courtyard. Then I saw Andrew appear, in a black t-shirt from the north side corner, quite near to me. He assumed Carl must have seen him when, in fact, he was facing a clear 90 degrees in the wrong direction and shouting after the wrong figure. There was no way the figure running across the midsection had been Andrew. 
nor was it Paul who was sat with the rest of the cast at the other side of the castle, waiting for the roundup to finish. They were all able to testify to his being there and each other. Andrew had been able to see me. I had been able to see Carl. Both Carl and I saw the white figure, and I held the keys to the castle and knew no one else was around. We never worked out quite what had happened, and the game stopped for the night. We stayed together, feeling safer in numbers, and our tents pitched closer than usual. I had the film developed a few weeks after the summer ended. Pictures from various locations. In all the pictures from Ashby de la Zouche, white figures are seen near all my cast members. A fuzzy, indefinite shape, usually long and vertical and placed off to the side, behind a shoulder or beside a person. This story was submitted to me by a listener of the podcast through the YouTube channel, Mel C, a.k.a. Chi Devlin. Thank you for sharing your story with me, and I hope I do it justice. I grew up with paranormal experiences. I was wondering which ones to reveal to you, but I suppose I shall share with you my worst encounter. Around 1999, I had been living on my eighth floor, fully paid for flat in Wilbledon for about a year. Life was chaotic as usual, and my boyfriend at the time was living with me. My flat is rather spacious with a balcony. As mentioned, it's on the eighth floor of a block of high-rise buildings at a housing estate. The layout was as such. Front door, directly in front, is a long rectangular storage room. To your right is the corridor leading directly to the kitchen. Going down the corridor, at the head, to your right, is my bedroom. Next to this is a guest bedroom, followed by a main lounge. In between the storage room and the kitchen, diagonal to the lounge is the bathroom and toilet, and the balcony runs from my bedroom right outside to the lounge. So my boyfriend was a kind of amateur photographer, taking pictures of anything and everything. He happened to take a few snaps of the flat at night, with most of the lights switched off, just to see if the camera would catch anything paranormal. Various things happened which led to a breakup but pictures of the flat were left in an envelope and forgotten about at that time. Due to the breakup, I suffered a mental breakdown and was admitted to a local psych ward. This happened around Halloween, November of 2000. At the ward, I met and made friends with a few patients. We still have mixed wards back then. We still had mixed wards back then. In particular, I befriended a lad who didn't have anywhere to live. Why his family didn't support him, I don't know. I liked him, I didn't fancy him as he was too young for me, and I later learned he was due to marry a girl closer to his age. In January 2001, I allowed this young lad to move in with me. At this time, my flat had no gas nor electric due to financial woes. For food and drink, we did takeouts, and for light, we did candles. It wasn't too cold, so heating really wasn't needed. The boy was quite superstitious and very interested in the occult and convinced me to play the Ouija board with him. We made our own board. We tried it out in my bedroom mid-afternoon and initially nothing happened. So we tried again later at night. Things did happen and quickly. Trance-like states as one of us while the others was unaffected, visible forces attacking us, throwing us off our feet, simultaneously and paralyzing us. We became concerned, obviously, and the boy became somewhat paranoid. On the 9th of January, we agreed the next day we would go consult a priest. Going into January 10th, around the traditional devil's hour, I woke for some reason and padded down to the main lounge. There, I saw the 18-year-old, standing over a string of candles surrounding the Ouija board. We looked at each other, but I could see it wasn't him. Something had taken him over. His eyes were pitch black. Before I could say or do anything, he kicked the candles over, and the lounge quickly became an inferno. In horror, I turned to run down the corridor where I always kept the keys in the front door for quick access. The keys were missing. I ran back to the lounge to see the young man calmly throw the keys into the fire before laughing a deep, hollow, evil laugh. He strode to follow me as I turned to run back down the corridor, where I banged on my bedroom walls and the front door for assistance. 
My neighbor heard, opened her front door, realized the massive communal hallway outside our flats was pitch black with smoke, and called the fire brigade, which arrived within five minutes. They crashed into the front door to find the young lad, who had already passed from smoke inhalation. Extinguishing the fire, they were exiting when they discovered me unconscious just behind the front door. I was rushed to A&E, and it said I was two minutes from death. I stayed in the ICU for two weeks before another stint in the psych ward. I happened to sneak a look at various reports from authorities. A note from the young man stated he was in love with me and he wanted us to die together. Trust me, that simply doesn't make sense and cannot be the case. I also got to see the photos the firemen took. One taken from my kitchen where I saw clear as day an apparition of the late young man staring straight into the camera. He was emotionless. After such an incident, I was simply unable to face my flat again and plans were made to sell after repairs were completed. A final strange thing, some belongings were returned to me, including the envelope of photos my ex-boyfriend had taken. In a picture of the kitchen, a distinct and white whirlwind can be seen rising at the center from floor to ceiling. I was lucky to have survived. It was ruled an accidental fire, but to me, it was not. It was caused by something paranormal. When we messed with something, we shouldn't have. As a sort of part two to this, during repairs, mostly due to smoke damage, I was placed in temporary accommodation at a place called Hackney, near a rather famous place called the Woodland Walk. Time passed by and I befriended a middle-aged couple who were new age and all of that. They had a pack of six massive dogs. During some nights, we would walk the dogs at the Woodland Walk. It's a long and winding stretch of walkway surrounded by woodland, hence the name. At regular intervals at either side, there would be sealed archways to abandoned tunnels. It's been said that the Sandman haunts the walk. So it came one wintry night in the early hours, we set out with the dogs. The place was dark, deserted, and deathly quiet. We walked through a lighted tunnel, when in the short distance, we saw a shadowy figure coming towards us. Immediately, the dogs went berserk, and all three of us stopped. As for the figure, he was tall, well-dressed, but we couldn't actually see his face. And either side of him was his dogs, two black jackals. The strangest thing, he halted on the outskirts of the slighted tunnels, and the jackals calmly and obediently halted next to him. He didn't make a sound a few minutes. We three, somewhat shocked and spooked, our dogs now whimpering and trying to pull us back the way we came from. So that's what we did. Just as we exited the other end of the tunnel, we glanced back and were surprised to see a rolling mist coming towards us but the stranger with the two jackals had disappeared. We rushed back to the couple's home where I spent the night on their couch. Before retiring for the night, the couple warned me, during the night I may hear sounds of a horse-drawn carriage outside, in which case I must not react and investigate. It was further explained that it is death and his carriage patrolling to take souls away with him. I didn't really hear anything, however by morning, we realized all the dogs were surrounding me. The couple said the dogs instinctively did that as protection of me. I did go back to the flat to collect some belongings with the middle of the couple in tow. Outside the block, we looked up to see odd lights blinking in the flat, and the man, aware of the situation, cited that he believed the young boy was still in my flat. The Bloody Chapel, submitted by T.K. Goose. My story takes place in October 2009. I was 20 years old, traveling England and Ireland with my best friend, Amanda. I had family in England and she had five cousins, all sisters, in Ireland, so we were making our way from house to house, both of our first time across the Pacific. We arrived at the next stop on our family visit tour at her cousin Suzanne and husband's sprawling farmhouse in Burr. They were so lovely, but unlike the other cousins, they didn't drink. So instead of taking us to pubs each night, they planned some fun local activities for us to do. We awake on our second day to find out that Suzanne has asked, through some connection she had, if we could have a private tour of Leap Castle in a nearby town. I'm a history major, so I'm very keen on the idea, and she tells us this family lives there, but they've happily agreed to let us into their home. Now, long after this, every haunted castle book I've ever flipped through, I have seen this castle, 
and the kind man who owns it is sprawled across their pages. This castle is very famously haunted. Twenty-year-old me did not know this, and I was stoked to see the inside of it. The man and his wife greet us outside, and they're incredibly friendly, inviting us to chat a while. I get a few spooky feelings, but chalk it up to being a very old castle. Eventually, he leads us up a very tight, very winding, candlelit staircase lined with cobblestones. It's incredibly claustrophobic, and I'm flooded with visions of people from hundreds upon hundreds of years past, making their way up and down these stairs by candlelight. We eventually make our way into a wide open space, quite high up. There are now plenty of gaping windows opening in the large rock walls that allow natural light to flood in. He tells us the story of the room. We are in the bloody chapel. Guests would be summoned under the guise of being invited for a feast, only to be murdered. The story is interesting and I'm intrigued. But off to my right, I see a dark opening in the rock wall. I wander off from the group, needing to investigate. I walk straight up to the opening and despite daylight pouring in around me, I can't see one foot into this large opening. It's completely black. Something comes over me, and even though I've historically been very much a scaredy cat, particularly about the dark, I am so compelled to walk in. I am in two places at once, fighting this overwhelming urge to wander into this dark space, still standing in the same spot in what feels like a trance, while also listening to our guide gleefully tell stories of the Bloody Chapel's past, unaware, I think, that I've wandered off. I snap back into reality with a chill, thinking, why the heck would I walk into this dark hallway without knowing what lies ahead? I whip out my trusty digital camera and take a picture. I now see it is a short space with what appears to have a hole in the ground. I pop out of the darkened room and ask our lovely host, what's in here? That's the oubliette, he says. And here's an explanation on Wikipedia from this specific castle. During the renovation of the castle in the 1900s, workers found a hidden wall behind the chapel. At the bottom of the shaft were many human skeletons amassed on wooden spikes. When cleaned out, it took three cartloads to remove the bones. Today, the dungeon is now covered over and ordered to keep people away from it. It is believed that the O'Carrolls would drop guests through the trap door to be impaled on the spikes eight feet below. A pocket watch found at the same time, dating from the mid-1800s, shows how recently the oubliette may have been used. I'm very curious as to when this was updated, as when I was there in 2009 with some powerful force begging me to walk in to my certain death, the floor was not covered, and our host jokingly warned us not to go in after I've asked about it. I've never felt so compelled without reason, as if I'd been hypnotized or something to involuntarily do something. I remember my physical body battling my mind in disagreement. I'm very grateful my body won and I didn't take another two steps inside. I was so touched by the kindness of the host to let us into their home, but I could not wait to leave that castle. I remember watching it slowly disappear behind us, staring up at that chapel for as long as I could, still somehow drawn to it from two miles down the road. The Nightmares of Waterford Castle, submitted by user Midnight Society. When I was 13, my father took me to a trip to Ireland. It was my first time traveling abroad, and adding to the novelty of this was the fact that my father's new girlfriend was coming along. Her teenage son, heavily tattooed and simmering with rage, would be joining our travel party. My sisters and I were not enthusiastic about spending our vacation in the closed quarters of our modern family. We were still adjusting to the divorce, which had barely been finalized, but we were excited too. Ireland was enchanting, all the people milling about with their fascinating accents. We stayed in some lovely places, houses that were sweet with must and so old, older than any place we had seen at this point in our American lives. And towards the end of the trip, we spent a few nights in an actual castle. The family who owned the castle had maintained the property for centuries and used one of the floors as their primary residence. The rest of the rooms were available to travelers, though we were the only guests. The place had a particularly sinister atmosphere. 
It was dark and cold, with towering walls and long, narrow passages. Despite being an anxious child, I never had any problems staying or falling asleep. But that night, I woke up instantly. I didn't see anything but the vague outlines of furniture. The rooms were packed with beds and antique lamps, but I remember a pressure in the darkness, a feeling that I hadn't felt before. Someone was there. After several minutes, I ran towards the nearest light switch. Then I went to find my father. I forced him to sleep in the bed next to mine, and I turned on all the lights. The following morning, we explored the grounds. After walking for a period of time, we left the castle behind us and came upon a misty pasture. In the distance, horses grazed, and at the crest of a hill, there was a stone wall surrounding a tiny cemetery. The headstones were plain and small. As a group, we were curious. Who was buried there? Family members? The previous caretakers? We opened the fence and ascended the slope. But as soon as we closed the wrought iron gate behind us, shutting ourselves into the cemetery, something strange happened. The horses began to stroll placidly in our direction. It was odd, as though they had been trained to approach or were expecting something. Then, slowly, they surrounded us in a circle, stoic and immobile. Their heads hung over the walls and they stared at us with the liquid black pools of their eyes. Even though I liked horses, and I was the type of kid who would impulsively pet any animal, I didn't move. This experience struck everyone as a sign that it was time to leave. So after a few glances, we huddled back through the gate. Perhaps there was a beat of silence. The next thing I remember was the sound of a high-pitched squeal and several horses rearing all at once. I registered a hoof at eye level and stumbled backwards, receiving a blow to the top of my foot. We ran and I limped to the fence amidst the frenzied entourage of horses. From the gap in the fence I looked back just as suddenly the horses were calm, swishing their tails with serene expressions as though someone had flipped a switch. That evening we told our stepbrother about the pasture pandemonium. Being a teen, he had opted out of the imposed family time. Without looking up, he chuckled. Oh yeah, this place is haunted. He had overheard the staff exchanging their paranormal experiences when we checked in. I know what you're thinking. Perhaps the horses we saw that day were just really, really territorial. At a remote castle on the outskirts of the oldest city in Ireland. Or maybe they were possessed by the dead. And that's all for this episode and our trip to the UK. As always, I would love to hear your own stories or hometown hauntings. If you're from the UK, I would love to hear your family tales, local hauntings, or personal experiences as well. I have some great episodes planned for this season, so I hope you will return. In the meantime, I hope all you ghouls and ghosts stay safe, and I'll see you next time.